flashing light warning. Epilepsy havers, beware. The year is 1990, and a group of Xenix employees are forming their own Sega subsidiary dev studio, Sega CD4, quickly renamed Sonic. Software Planning, a studio famous for creating zero Sonic the Hedgehog games, but it did create Shining, the franchise, before leaving Sega, rebranding as Camelot, <laughs> developing the Golden Sun games, and being forced by Nintendo to develop Mario Tennis or whatever until the end of time. Look, horrible tragedy can be funny, too. I don't need a joke for this segment. Now, Shining is a lot of things, but it started as a dungeon crawler. Also, there's animals. A lot of anthropomorphic animals. It's Sega, okay? That's why all the animals... Fetish Factory Sega tasked Sonic Software Planning to create a Dragon Quest competitor for Sega hardware, the Mega Drive, or Genesis. And by 91, we got Shining in the darkness. We'll be covering Shining the Holy Ark today as well. And if you know your game history, you might be asking, why? The Sega Saturn's years after the Genesis K-Bash, there's a whole bunch of Shining games between these two, and acknowledged, but Shining started as a dungeon crawler, and the Holy Ark is the only other dungeon crawler in the entire series. A neat point of comparison, but more importantly, Sonic Software Planning, Camelot is not an enormous studio, and the Holy Ark specifically acts as the blueprint for Golden Sun. I know that sounds crazy, especially when Beyond the Beyond is probably the genuine origin point, but I'm telling you, if you're a Golden Sun fan, you gotta see it. Alright, open them dungeon doors and let's jump right in! Oh! 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 Ow, what the f- Shining in the Darkness. That's a name. I mean, it's a good title. Wandering through a dark dungeon with only a torch to light the way. Being the candle in the dark against evil. A hidden gem you should totally buy, you guys. It's a quaint game, you know. Talk to this Merlin-looking guy, load into the world of three locations, only one of which is actually explorable. Talk to the king, the princess has been kidnapped, here's 20 bucks, go save the world. Okay. Now, adventuring is lonely and terrifying at first. You're one person in a dungeon of eyeball worms, but the wizard assured me I had friends, so let's find them. Oh dear god, no. It's okay, father. You, you can keep Milo. Well, Pyra's okay anyway. She's just, you know, liable to cast curses on fellow adventurers, so they die cruel, lonely deaths in the labyrinth. We're the good guys! This thing's available on all kinds of platforms. Original hardware, PS3, 360, and Steam. It's a decent dungeon crawler. You'll be traversing the enormous labyrinth, chopping up worms. You can see the Dragon Quest influence. Like, not just the slimes with faces. More that deep in a dungeon on low HP, the stupidest thing ever. It's gonna kick your ass. This is the face of death. All the while, you're listening to the highest of frequencies on loop, that 32-bit king sh- Woo! It's the kind of game you can estimate the totality of, right? What's in the dungeon? Doors you need to open with keys you need to find. Traps and chests, even on the floor. This guy's name is Killwave. Look at how happy! This is the face of death. Tricks and secrets, hidden passageways. It's an environment you need to master with memory, practice, and failure. You're going to get lost. You're going to get jumped by two or three more enemies than expected. You're going to get crit. You have no idea what's inside any treasure chest. It's a ghost with an instant kill spell. You have no idea what these enemies do, how much damage they can do, and one death in the party means a trip home to the local church. And you better pray for mercy. So you load up using your vast wealth made from killing waves of monsters, hope 24 item slots, counting equipment is enough, so 12, for all the treasure you'll find and healing items you'll be bringing along. This game was made for submissives, always or never and. Whoa! Speaking of which, these kinds of games, old JRPGs, dungeon crawlers, or otherwise, are amazing for teaching kids people how to save and expend resources. You know, next time Twitter tells you the latest game is game of the year for the eighth time in a row, maybe give it that extra thought next time. I genuinely believe RPGs made me better with money, and like, how could they not? You're forced to trudge through winding mazes laced with danger, endless enemy encounters, tiles made specifically to drain your MP, actively capping your access to healing magic, you don't get a revival spell until very late in the game, and you've got to take up inventory slots or spend MP to return home with 
without running it back through basically hell. There are crabs around corners and they hate you. The game's out to get you and mindfulness is half the battle. No wonder the West tends to bounce off JRPGs. Occasionally you'll come across a temporary party member in a dungeon, usually so you can ferry them home. Shoot, some of them are outright skippable. You're supposed to find that lizard guy Pyra cast slow magic on and pull him out of trouble, but I never did, so he's dead. The dungeon levels aren't incredibly clever, they're mazes, like outside of the occasional monster wall, spinning floor tile, obnoxious trap, or hole in the ceiling, there's not much going on, and that's fine, it's an early title and pretty well put together, though it's not without its own brand of weird. One Camelot staple, or Golden Sun staple I guess, is cursed items that usually people don't bother with because they carry a pretty substantial chance to be rendered immobile, and that really sucks, but in Shining in the Darkness, the early game Hex Whip does so much group damage without costing MP, it's straight up more efficient just taking the constant stun chance and doing numbers. The game's just like that, most of the treasure is crap, you're often finding pennies in chests while enemies are dropping rent payments, but every so often you find something really great, like the light sword that's meant for the main character, but it's just better held in someone's inventory so they can pop off free high damage lightning spells. If you're patient and go looking for the good, it's there. But there's not much to talk about outside of those minute quirks, except that static ceiling. Oh, I'm gonna... Oh. It's a dungeon crawling JRPG. You level up and do a dungeon floor. You take an hour to grind between dungeon floors and sometimes too. Thankfully, there's a handy speed up button, at least in modern versions. Every floor you fight at least one boss and really, they're not mechanically minded in general. It's a numbers game. You had the bigger numbers. You healed off more than what rolled in. The armor you grinded for shunted most of it. It's not even a game worth optimizing or strategizing around. The dungeon is significantly more painful than any single enemy. But what happened in the story? Was it good? I mean, your trio of goons ends up saving the princess with minimal losses. Sure, you kill the main character's corrupted father in single combat, but that's about the only real twist. Sure, the game throws this dweeb Melville in front of you, who turns out to be Dark Soul himself, the antagonist. Yeah, Dark Soul. You would, Melville. Except it's actually Mephisto, and his dad's name is Dark Soul, but it got mistranslated. What's good, Shining Hyperfan? Preempted! Preempted! Thankfully, Gandalf was there to help. It's a Genesis era RPG story written by the guy who went on to write Golden Sun. Yes, Dragon Quest V debuted a year later and FF4 in the same year, and Buddy's still on Dark Sun, Gandalf, and Damsels. It was a different era. Real JRPG gamers out here playing for the Sigma grind set, okay? Stacking paper doing numbers. I don't care about all that story crap. If anything, even though I'm interested in Shining, I got the biggest kick out of seeing the Golden Sun Studios origins. These menus, the yes-no system, cursed items, maze dungeons, kingdoms, and strange evil men. But all of that is ten times more interesting in the Holy Ark. This one released in 97 for the Sega Saturn, a console that did well in Japan and flopped so hard in the West. I mean, really, 100 bucks more for the PS1 in 95? Google says that's almost 200 USD relative to inflation. Yikes. So this entry was developed after several other major Shining games, most of Shining Force to be clear, but the Holy Ark abandons the Devil King saga presented in those titles and introduces the Vandals and Innovators saga. So it's avoiding the lineage of Shining Force in gameplay and narrative, while respecting its origins. Spicy! It opens with three strange people shooting energy balls at an airship, the Holy Ark, and an escape pod flies out. You will not believe the where and what. Now, the premise is simple. You're gonna have to bear with me on this one. Melody and Forte are a pair of traveling mercenaries who hired you, Arthur, to assist them in taking down an apparently criminal ninja named Rhodey, who's holed up in a cave. Man, look at these weird doll people. Okay, bye! As you confront the ninja in combat, the escape pod crashes through the roof. They're doing the freeze frame thing. This is the Golden Sun intro. What did I say? And now everyone's dead or dying. Melody's ribs are crushed. Rhodey has brain damage. Thankfully, the aliens 
from the escape pod feel bad about killing four people and possess them. And they're really specific about the characters having free will. You gotta help us, you guys. We almost killed. See, there's a prophecy. A thousand year old kingdom is gonna be resurrected, I guess. And that would usher in an age of darkness. And you gotta help us do this. And you're all allies now. And you're helping us. Free will, though, by the way. This is all of your own volition, you see. Except Forte was possessed by an evil spirit instead. And he's gonna be an antagonist for a while. I can smell Alex. Be blue haired. Look down on others. Antagonist, but never directly. It's Alex, dude. Why is it Alex? The adventure goes from there, traveling from town to town, collecting the plot coupons, redeeming them at the local hub for a cutscene and a boss battle. So let's talk coupon collecting. As a dungeon crawler, it's already shooting high. The jump to polygons, rendered environments, and the focus on believable rocks, caves, and forestry makes the dungeons bare minimum interesting. It's decently fun to explore. That goes double for towns. Like, RPG towns are fine. We don't need an inquiry into JRPG towns, but being given first-person control, wandering through a place with people, that's the kind of stuff gaming was built to do. Even more so when side quests with tangible benefits exist, when hidden items are plentiful, when the game outwardly acknowledges that you shouldn't steal coins from under someone's bed. It'll never stop you again going forward. That kind of addition, reactive dialogue, would have been a luxury. But it makes the point early on that the world is believable. Even the fantastical things like beastmen and dwarves belong. For example, the wolf man ninja, Doyle, who punches like Star Platinum. That exists. You don't get to question it. It's shining. You'll take your punch wolf and like it. Now, encounter rate's a huge point of contention in JRPGs. Sure, but part of the frustration with random encounters is the jump scare nature of the system. The player's forcibly jerked out of any established immersion or agency, and that's only really mitigated inherently by frequency. The number of random encounters can dull the annoyance, make it permissible, just something to handle or backfire and take it over the top. Have fun walking the edge, game designers. Part of why Chrono Trigger was great was that encounters were contextualized in the dungeons you explored. No cut, no break, you seamlessly enter combat in the world, and it's incredible to experience. And that's basically what the Holy Ark does. When you move through dungeon tiles, you'll be confronted by enemies who walk around the corner, drop in from the ceiling, run in from off camera. It's like I'm really there, bro! Great care and effort went into making engaging with the world as real as possible. Did I mention Motoi Sakuraba composed for this game? You can insert your panpipe into my ear anytime. Sadly, grinding is still mandatory. Most of the bosses are extremely punishing unless you pass a numbers check, more or less. Like, very few ways to subvert hard numbers exist. If the boss is gonna blast the party with lasers for a quarter of their HP every turn, and there's no mass heal spell until the halfway mark, yeah the game wants you to grind. Especially with how it gates buff spells behind certain party members, but enough. Okay. Dungeon design. It's a dungeon crawler, so every dungeon's a maze. Almost goes without saying. Dead ends, tricks, puzzles, paths. It's shining in the darkness, expanded for a new era. And there's all kinds of little quirks in each to break up the slog. In one dungeon, you have to double tap forward to break down doors. But I didn't read the instruction manual till halfway through. What a treat. In one dungeon, you go upside down and walk through the entire dungeon again. What joy. <laughs> In one dungeon, you slide on the ice tiles and fall down hole. What fun! In one dungeon, you feed the turtle and cross to new sections. This one's okay. I, I don't have a sarcastic remark about that kind of thing. A lot of the puzzles can't simply be felt out. They need to be puzzled out. It literally hands the player a basic bar exam logic puzzle. No, I'm not kidding. To greenlight the boss fight of a dungeon. The audacity of this bit. Somehow, despite featuring similar gameplay across dungeons, despite the game never really changing in significant ways, the dungeons are unique and the gameplay is varied. Good work, Camelot. And there's another neat system I haven't even mentioned yet. Pixies. The Holy Ark wants players to lose themselves in the setting, to care about what's in front of them, and a totally extraneous way it does this is with pixies. Strewn throughout the world, hidden behind side quest completion, in barrels, in the water, in rocks, are fairies, pixies, succubi, incubi, and leprechauns. Yep. Another one for the jar. They're a collectible reward handed to curious players that don't do a ton, but they can be fired off as a battle begins, provided you press the button relative to what direction the enemy is approaching from. I really like this, especially early, because you can tack on free damage on reaction in a JRPG. But can you handle my army of goons? And even if you don't, it doesn't matter. It's not enough to cry about. There's even a reward for collecting all of them. Side note. 
Tip your guide riders. Saying all this, you might assume I'm excited about the game. But hey, grab the rose, take five piercing damage. That's the expression, right? Also, combat in all these games is basically playing normally until the enemy decides to cast spell and flashbang UIRL. Oh! The performance, even on original hardware, is spotty at best. It's an ambitious title, and it shows. Is that euphemistic enough? Most of the presentation in town, specifically the menus meant to further immerse you instead of using a simple drop-down, becomes endearing clunk, but clunk regardless. The combat's slow as death, and the encounters are still too frequent. It's hard to have fun actively, like you might veg out, mentally flatline, if you're lucky. The grinding gets really annoying. Even fighting every enemy multiple times in a dungeon, I needed to take explicit grinding time out of my recording to punch through at least three bosses. Either they're balanced razor sharp, or there's too much care put into numbers and too little utility given to party members. And let's talk about that for a sec. You get eight members by the end, a four-person roster with four swappable backups, but you start with three, and that goes for a while. Get a fourth, and that goes for a while, get a fifth, and that goes way too long before you're eventually handed six, seven, and eight in short order. It's frustrating, especially because two of eight lack any kind of magic, zero utility. I like Doyle, but I like Doyle because early on you can forge him a mithril claw that carries two whole dungeons by itself. That's it. Oh man, come on. Many characters are good, but not good enough. Arthur is a mainstay because he can do everything and hits hard too. The melody doesn't get a group heal until very, very late in the game, which strains her usefulness in many boss fights. Rowdy is frail and ends up doing more AOE damage than anything because for some reason debuffs never work on enemy bosses, and that's his shtick. I read a guide that instructed me to use debuffs on bosses and they never worked once. Emulator issue, guide issue, who knows? It was very sucks. Basso and Doyle have zero utility, Lisa, a major utility character, doesn't join until very late, and Akane is only useful when her mass heal hits level 2, which takes a massive chunk of grinding. I kind of forgot to record anything about Forte because he's unusable for most of the game, doesn't really do anything in the plot. Kinda like Alex! It's no wonder most of the boss strategy sections and guides read they weren't too much trouble or just hit them until they died because the game incentivizes grinding massively, more than most, and it strains enjoyability. The real frustration though, is the story. Look, I can't help myself. You're presented with most of the plot's major players right after the crash, where the player wanders through corridors seeing visions of Rowdy, a tormented bondage slave troll doll, a crone in a floating chair, and a mega vampire looking guy. And nothing is directly stated here except that this big guy doesn't want the thousand year kingdom to be resurrected, whatever that is. The creator, or god, is invoked, and destiny is involved somehow. That's a lot of moving parts that don't get a lot of explanation, but it's the intro. Fair enough. The pretense of the story, hunting down Rhodey, is abandoned so the crashed aliens can possess your bodies for their own survival, and yours. It just kind of works out. Heavy-handed? Yes. In town, you meet Basso and Lisa, wandering mercenaries who were supposed to find Rhodey, but heard he died in a cave-in. They end up recognizing Rhodey, and instead of trying to capture him for a payday, they let him go for now because the mountain pass is blocked off, so there's no escape, I guess? And the mayor says fighting is bad? Kind of completely infantilistic, but sure. Doyle meets you in the woods and informs Rhodey that he's an important ninja from the Far East Village and clearly suffering from amnesia. He masks him to hide his identity, turning him into Felix from Golden Sun. Wild how much they carried forward from this game. In the big city, you meet the third weirdo from the intro cutscene who approaches, blasts Fido for no discernible reason other than to highlight the character's villainy, in case the full-body red leather getup wasn't enough, and they disappear into smoke without a word because well, we gotta establish them somehow. Show don't tell works in every situation, after all. This one's particularly annoying because we have no idea who this is. They don't appear until the end game to kind of do something, and their motivations are unclear. The game just wants to establish up front that she's no good. Never really pays off, though. Entering the castle, you find Forte, Rylux the Crone, and the King. Now, Rylux has a crystal ball, knows it's Rhodey, who's in the mask, and who is, clearly, the one you, Melody, and Forte were sent to kill. So this entire situation ends with the party being dunked into the dungeon. I like this scene. It's dramatic and frustrating because we know Forte is possessed and Rylux is trouble. Finally, some good f uh. story. After Doyle jailbreaks us, we meet Sabato, someone clearly knowledgeable about the Thousand Year Kingdom. He tells us to go 
but talk to some guy, doesn't tell us why, and says all will be revealed. Right back to F-, we acquire Basso, do a lot of crap, and meet Master Gulm, the mega vampire from earlier. He knows we're possessed by spirits and starts lore dumping. Vandals are a race above humans. Gulm's the strongest vandal and just wants his peace and freedom. Unlike the other vandals, he has no interest in the return of the Thousand Year Kingdom. We're supposed to infer that it would be very bad for mortals and good for vandals, so that's never spelled out or sufficiently fleshed out. Gulm says go to three shrines and collect the plot coupons. Who boy. Even the next plot beat, meeting Rhodey's master, tells us nothing just to solve the mystery of the three shrines. After a dungeon, Panzer shows up, the troll doll, and this is where things get frustrating. Panzer is a vandal, the same as Rylix from a superhuman race of beings, but he's a young vandal, presumably raised in the same ninja village as Rhodey. No clue to who his mother is, for all we know vandals just live on the planet. Nothing special about them except that they're strong and live a long time at least. Info on this subject is so non-existent that my own statements are corroborated only by game text and a wiki page that looks like this. It's rough. You do some things and confront Rylix once again, this time kicking her ass after grinding because she's among the hardest bosses in the game at this point. I love moments like these. Panzer shows up and says, Okay, good job. Uh, I won't kill you now because we must go, you see. So, see you then. And I'm getting Mercury Lighthouse flashbacks. Like, Panzer just laid out Doyle a scene ago. He can take the party no problem. They're half dead from Rylix. Give me a break. Anyway, we save the king in Forte. We learn that the Vandals recently reawoke. Presumably from slumber, I guess, and Rylix only looks old because she's a weak vandal. That's why Gollum looks 45, but is the strongest vandal, while at least looks 18 and isn't. Also, she isn't blue, but is, in fact, a pure vandal. Someone please chart this sh- Ooh. Even better, we learn that spirits are sent by God to humans to become heroes, and not because their airship gets shot down by some blue folk and they accidentally kill four people. It's predestination. That's confirmed by the entire thing being prophesied on the walls underneath the castle, I guess. The spirit says, y'all have free will, then they hit you with the determinism. I'm done. Alex acquired, moldy tomb bread acquired, time is ticking, but the game's got dungeons to give, so all that plot is easy to forget, which only works in the game's favor, but that doesn't make it right. One thing I still dislike about Golden Sun is character development. People can say what they want and point to any little thing, but the Golden Sun characters barely scratch the surface of healthy, quality development, especially when it comes to affecting the plot meaningfully. Most are outwardly discarded come Dark Dawn. It's not great. And it's present here as well. Nobody changes meaningfully, they just learn more. Lisa might be the only one, a character introduced as someone who only bothers with strong people, and we find out it's because her own kingdom fell and nobody rose up against their oppressors. That's backstory. Her accepting the party is a little development, but again, as always, books stay winning. Finally, after diving into a time-frozen realm for a sec, we got the history and cosmology of the new Shining Universe. God granted spirits to heroes. Those heroes were called innovators. They ushered in an era of peace that was naturally destroyed by normal people taking the peace for granted, getting lazy, greedy, and corrupt. The innovators, heroes with spirits, became vandals overnight. So people granted spirits by God can be irreparably changed by the actions of humankind and how it behaves broadly. Empathy's a hell of a drug, I guess. The game sidles up to the question of evil, why would God allow this potentiality to exist? And naturally it's because it's a test. If society writ large can't live up to God's vision of a good society, he lets it destroy itself, or destroys it himself. This situation is unsatisfying for a million reasons, a lot of which gets into theological concepts and debates I don't want to have, so I'm gonna focus on the class angle. You have to be a pretty incurious, uncritical, or unempathetic person to think that an entire society could become corrupt. Corruption in society unambiguously comes from the top, those with power abusing it, and any other viewpoint either dismisses social strata as non-existent, which is idiocy, or gets a little too close to, well, the poors are that way because they're lazy, which is itself a lazy reactionary opinion. Weak sauce thoughts. What, the farmers drink too much? Charge too much for apples? There are lords. There are peasants. It's visible in game. It's a kingdom. We all know who did the corruption. You're not gonna sell me this tired old schlock, bud. Even being charitable in this case, let's imagine that corruption means that society broadly became immoral. How do you sell that as an imminent danger to the heroes of this game? How do you fight that? 
the immorality of the populace. Well, you beat up the vandals, the once heroes whose own god-given spirit gifts corrupted them, instead of intelligently posing them as what the party could become should the failings of society repeat. But now I'm imagining a more compelling story where the heroes try to help society instead of beating up the evils. It's a video game, what's she gonna do? But whatever, that's the backstory and little to do with the events of the plot presented. I just think the framing is tired and cringe. I like games like this for never being mad at God, ever. Even just having an angry, irreligious anti-hero or anything. The creator for sure destroys cultures deemed too corrupt. Not even evil, just corrupt, vaguely. Game story was apparently written as fantasy for adults. Well, now. Anyway, this sage turns you, Melody, and Rowdy into innovators. That means you get a super spell and not much else. Credit where it's due, the three spirit harboring party members don't stay dead after combat, like even before this moment, because the spirit is like a persistent candle that can't be snuffed by darkness. That's a great little gameplay narrative tie in. Wish we got more of that. The ending. The party arrives to stop the ritual, and I'm sorry for the gamer moment, but there were multiple dungeons between that last showdown. How slow can you possibly be? You battle Rylix, who has indirect support from Elise. It sucks. Oh, nice Doyle. Yeah, I'd say she ain't had that kind of hit in 30 years. Finally, Panzer has to admit their plan is ruined if nobody can defend him while he completes his ritual. Elise volunteers to finally do something because her sister was killed in front of her, and that makes her go, hmm, maybe I should be angry. Then Gollum shows up and says, no, I won't let you. Also, sorry about your sister. So Elise says, well, look, it's not because I care about her. I want to help my old lover, Panzer. Apparently. Maybe. But also, I want the player characters to suffer for some reason. Then Panzer becomes the master of evil and dies. And then Elise and Gollum leave after saying nothing of value, posturing that they know what God is planning, but refusing to enlighten the player. The spirits, minus one, get back in their ship and leave. It's kind of incredible to play Golden Sun again in 2022. I know my old videos got me all kinds of flack, they got problems, but I recently reacted to them over on Patreon and overall, they've got some points. And even when they're bad, immature, whatever, they're still decently substantive. But one thing they're missing, aside from being perfectly genuine, is any kind of historical understanding of Camelot. That and most of the story criticism is airy, hard to materialize, the kind of thing a comparison might have helped. Here's a fun fact. Hiroyuki Takahashi is the credited writer for all of Golden Sun and most of the Shining series, including Shining Force 3, which came out soon after and is based on the same world as Holy Ark. Though Shining the Holy Ark lists no writer, neither on Wikipedia nor in the credits, it's fair to say that Takahashi most likely wrote the game in part or alone, and it's really easy to demonstrate because his fingerprints are all over the work. Just compare it to Golden Sun, a game about a party of magical people living largely apart from normal society, traveling across the world, collecting magical creatures to power up, being deliberately misdirected by powers beyond their understanding and unfathomable entities, being brought into conflict with eventual allies, opposing a tribe of strangely colored individuals with weird hair and clothes, and gathering and using magical artifacts to seal or unleash, depending on the game, an unknowable future of at least some ill portent, at least how it's initially sold to the player. They're filled with obvious consistencies in UI, visuals, color, some characters might as well be Golden Sun characters. Jin are pixies reskinned and made a core feature. The Vandals are just the dudes from Prox, even if it's largely aesthetic. Both games have a preoccupation with the globe, with East meeting West, ninjas ex knights. Both end with parties of eight, swapped at the player's discretion. Puzzles abound, and why why wouldn't every dungeon in Golden Sun be a maze? That's the only kind of dungeon Camelot ever designed. But the worst inherited trait from Ark is story. They both obfuscate the tale being told deliberately. Characters aren't given screen time, individual actions, or even quality dialogue for meaningful development. Characters with knowledge never take the time to fill the player in, always saying, wait and see. You don't need to know yet. Their stories read like they're being written as the game is being developed. Characters have wildly inconsistent presentation or motivations, they will actively contradict themselves as though the writer can't characterize. 
or won't characterize. They leave their endings dangling for no good reason. Just a little wait and see. They both involve cosmologies with aloof deities that are demonstrably callous, bordering on cruel. And ultimately, someone is always hunting for power with no stated or otherwise understood end goal. Simply acquire power so I can... Shining the Holy Ark is a fine game in its own right, a real old era adventure, but it's impossible to divorce from Golden Sun. It's the blueprint to a game I've spent years thinking about. Demonstrating bad writing, or more charitably, writing that doesn't always work, isn't a so what essay moment on its own. It's not a conclusion, though it does feel a lot like vindication. This isn't a fringe case, see, this is a pattern, and it'd be real easy to point at other JRPGs and say, well, they were doing great things, so why not Camelot? And it's probably because Camelot's a smaller scale studio, whose lead producer on many games also writes the scripts. Game devs hard. And eventually, between his own work, the illustrator, and the rest of the team, Camelot produced a series that stuck with people for decades. What's fascinating is how much of Shining contributes to Golden Sun, leads into Golden Sun. Like Shining was commissioned by Sega to buff JRPG presence on Sega consoles, and despite many great games, the series eventually moved on, and frankly, people don't talk about Shining as fervently. Maybe because their great capstone, Shining Force 3, built on the bones of Holy Ark, only saw one third of itself released to the west, with the other two lost to Japan, relegated to imperfect emulators. I may not be a fan of Takashi's writing, but it's impossible to deny the charm. The allure of world fantasy set to Motoi Sakuraba's music, where foe becomes friend, east meets west, arcane secrets hide away in dark labyrinths where the mundane and the fantastical clash in worlds on the brink of a new era, set under a golden sun, all because of a quaint candle shining in the darkness. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons whose names are on the screen. The show's finally getting somewhere thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welsh, Acropolon, Alex, Andy Blar, Arch, Axon A, Basement Dweller, BZ Soul, Ben M, Blake Against the Machine, Bohop, Boom Dead, Brios, Brianna Wu, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wave, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Cordon, Cody Golden, Couch Mo, Corgi the Lad, Crater, CW Glass, Kyle Priest, Cynical, Daddy Dagoth, Don Diem, Dakota Storm Jones, Jones Dakey Stag Swaggy, David Beck, Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Dead, Dennis Amaya, Diablo, Dr. Cullen, PhD, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Funk, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Aesthetica, Everstone Isle, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyphseeker, Goose, 6112, Garcory, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crackhouse, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, Hexmet, Horn Tiger, Huey, If the world chooses I'm to become supporting my enemy, just I because I wanted like to make I this part of the have. video longer, Ingenious Cloud, I punched a sandwich, Irradiated Cherry, Dice Kyle, It's time to sue, It's not good, Ivy Ruth Langley, Jacob, James, Jason Lasky, Jaden, Jay Deus, Joke Frog, Jordan Joiner, Julian, my Julian. Keegan, too cool. Cut a snack. Clock crated. Crazy dark chocolate. Pice. KZ excellent. Lady Dentalian. Matrix. Laundry mom. Lego Sid. Loathsome dung eater. Juan. Low fat mogul. Lucas Boyd. Lucky McSmucky. Magical Madman. Mama Rowling. Mara Ganger. Mercules. Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Mike DeVille. Mookie Moo Official. Monochrome only. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Nyranu. Nido Torpedo. Dorian Deridius. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Only LK. The Plant. Pandemic Cowboy. Pinata, PK Gaming, Hockey for Hitman, Potato Gaming HD, Quasar McDougal, Quillworth, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Ruby Hellheim, Sagit Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Scribe Slendy, Sakai No Awarda, Shod, Silver Bear 909, Sim. God! Sleepy Wabbit. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squidget. Squishward. Starbound. Storm Strider. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Sandwich Guy. George Chubbington. The Big Bubby. The Salt Knight. Big Dick Mystic. Thrips Hartrock. Timid the Writer. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chungus. Vid. Valenrist. Venom. Vice Pup. Viewers Like You. Vic. Waposa. Weed Trash. Well Shit. Wayland. Where Am I Hell? Winter Solstice. Zanny Tanner. Yashichi. Yeet Kundo. Zachary Lives. Zachary Z. Also. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zeradax. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Zalazar. Sylvlin Ray. Cyberbunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got all kinds of goals and lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.